Beautiful. Well, welcome to all of you. We'll be starting in just a moment. Um, we're waiting for people to join in to this virtual press conference. So we will be with you all in a moment. You're seeing me, John Cavana from the Institute for Policy Studies, Alejandro Artiga Purcell from San Jose State University, and Angela Sambrano, a lawyer, um, one of the founding members of CISPES. And We'll be with you just in a moment. It's great, great to have so many of you joining in. Um, just a couple of things as we get started. Uh, we'll be speaking for about 12 to 15 minutes, but then we are open for questions and you'll be able to ask questions either by, if you want, typing them in the Q&A function down there at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand um, or you, uh, and we'll recognize you and you'll be able to ask your question in person. Um, or you can, yeah, simply raise your hand and we'll, we'll recognize you. Our goal is to go till 1130. If any of you have questions beyond that, we can stay on a bit longer. Um, so I think, uh, we're all set. I think everyone who's, who's joining, um, at 11 has joined in so we can get started. Um, so one welcome second, again. One second, John. Yes, could, yeah, could, could I just mention that there's translation in Spanish? Of course, yeah. Well, just starting right in, there is translation in Spanish. But, uh, I'll, say in, okay, I'll say in Spanish, just yeah. in case for the... Yeah. Que hay traducción en español, hay que presionar el globo para accesar eh, el cuarto de, de español. Right, it's wonderful. Yeah, we have both English speakers and French and Spanish speakers on with us. So uh, great um, thanks to Hillary, our interpreter today, uh, and she'll be interpreting into Spanish. Also, by the way, when this is over, uh, this will be up on the Mining Watch uh, Facebook Live channel. Also, uh, it, uh, United Church of Christ is uh, United Church of Canada is will be resharing on Facebook Live, and it will also be up on the Mining Watch YouTube channel. Um, okay, so we'll dive right in, um, the three of us. Welcome again. Um, today's press conference is on the first anniversary, as you all know, of the arrest in El Salvador of five water defenders who had been heroes of the 13-year successful campaign to prohibit all metals mining in El Salvador to save the country's rivers. It's great to see you all here just three and a half weeks before a historic election in El Salvador where President Nayib Bukele is attempting in violation of the constitution to become the first modern president in El Salvador to serve two consecutive terms. Uh, today, as you all know, we are releasing in both English and Spanish, a new report entitled State of Deception fact-finding report on the detained El Salvador water defenders, mining, and the state of human rights under the Bukele administration. The re report is a result of a fact-finding delegation of eight academics and nonprofit leaders who traveled to El Salvador from October 15 to 20 of last year. And the report is endorsed by nine organizations in Canada, the United States, and El Salvador. Uh, it is available on our Institute for Policy Studies website. It will be up on the Mining Watch website, and there will be a link in the chat uh, to where you can find it. Um, today, we're spending these first 12 or so minutes of the press conference hearing from three members of the delegation, and then we're opening the floor to questions. Um, the three of you, the three of us, who you will hear from briefly are myself, uh, John Cavana, I'm a senior advisor at the Washington-based Institute for Policy Studies and co-author of the book uh, with Robin Broad called The Water Defenders. Uh, then we'll go to Alejandro Artiga Purcell, assistant professor of environmental communication at San Jose State University, whose research focuses on environmental justice and social movements in Central America. And finally, to Angela Sanbrano, a lawyer, former coordinator of the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, and she served as the executive director and board member of several organizations that provide direct services and advocacy on immigration, labor, and human rights. 
So let me start by just saying a few words about the delegation and our major findings. Um, so from October 15 to 20, our eight delegates from the United States and Canada held a series of meetings, 19 meetings with leaders of civil society groups, human rights groups, lawyers, economists, a member of the legislature and others in El Salvador. We visited four municipalities in the Northern Department of Cabañas, which is the heart of mining country or what was mining country. And the delegation also participated in a ceremony to mark the 40th anniversary of the human rights organization Tutela Legal Maria Julia Hernandez and to present that organization with the 2023 Institute for Policy Studies Letelier Moffat Human Rights Award. And I'm just gonna take two minutes to say we have four major findings from this delegation. Um, first, among the over 70,000 people that Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele has incarcerated under abysmal conditions, are tens of thousands of innocent people, including these five water defenders and 17 labor leaders. Our interviews and our study of the evidence led us to conclude that this case should be dropped for several reasons. It's unsubstantiated by evidence. It is a violation of the Amnesty and the National Reconciliation Act of 1992. It's a violation of due process and it's likely politically motivated. We're happy to say more about this in the questions. Second finding, we discovered and were told about compelling evidence that President Bukele desires to violate the unanimous 2017 vote in the Salvadoran legislature to prohibit mining, a move that would endanger the country's water supply and violate the public will. And in the report, we go into seven signs that we were told on the delegation uh, that point to this conclusion that the Bukele administration wants to restart mining. Happy to talk about this. Third finding, President Bukele has taken a series of steps to reduce the independence of the ju judiciary, to violate basic human rights, and to suspend civil liberties and the rule of law, all in the name of protecting the population from violence caused by gangs. He's starving city governments of finances while expanding the military, and he's diverting millions of dollars borrowed from abroad for his cronies. And Alejandro will touch more on this. And finally, fourth, we end the report with recommendations that Angela will speak to in a moment. So at this point, I turn over the microphone to delegation member, uh, San Jose State University professor, Alejandro Artiga Purcell. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, John. And thank you all for being here. I'll try and go slow for the, the interpretation. Um, it's nice to have so many people join us as we mark the one year anniversary of the arrest of the five Salvadoran water defenders. Um, as our fact finding delegation met with the various groups that John mentioned um, to better understand kind of the strange and tragic circumstances surrounding this particular case of the detention of the five water defenders, uh, we learned that any explanation of why these environmentalists and community leaders were arrested must be placed in the broader social and political context of El Salvador, and specifically the context of the current state of exception that remains that has remained in effect since March of 2022. Now, three points stood out to us in our interviews and uh, with these, these various groups. Uh, first, we learned that the Salvadoran state's abuse of power runs far deeper than the criminalization of environmentalists. Uh, it includes financial corp uh, corruption, a lack of political transparency, and the intimidation of political opponents, labor leaders, journalists, and non-governmental organizations. So the arrest of the five water defenders, who, as John mentioned, were key figures um, in one of the most successful social movements, not just in El Salvador, but in all of Latin America. Um, their arrest sends a very clear message of intimidation to Salvadoran civil society. Uh, the message being that anyone who stands up for human rights risks becoming a target of criminalization under this state of exception. A second point is that the violation of due process 
for these five water defenders mirrors a much broader trend of the violation of human rights of the more than 70,000 people who have been arrested in El Salvador um, since the state of exception, often arbitrarily, who have been jailed without due process and subjected to really appalling prison conditions that we found out included inadequate access to food, water, and health care, limited communication with defense counsel and family members, and even subjection to torture, communal punishment, and death. So these horrors really reverberate beyond any one individual or individual case. The targeting of the poor, the systematic targeting of the poor, of young ones, of those with tattoos, those living under gang-controlled territories, and even those who have been extorted by the gangs, um, has left many Salvadoran families with the debilitating costs of losing a breadwinner while also having to pay for the legal fees to get their, their person out of prison and also to pay for the meal plan so that person can survive and eat in prison. Uh, these economic stressors, of course, are compounded by the psychological stressors of not being able to communicate uh, or know where the loved one is. Um, and so what we, what we found was that this inhumane criminalization of poverty under the El Salvador state of exception has really unraveled the social fabric of entire communities, uh, which in an ironic and, and cruel irony uh, has led to deepening of poverty and desperation in a very dangerous and vicious cycle. And lastly, almost everyone that we spoke to uh, in this delegation noted a general and pervasive sense of fear of living under the state of exception. And it was noted that this fear is specifically of growing authoritarianism in El Salvador. And it seemed to us to be a paralyzing fear, uh, a fear that really threatens to undermine Salvadoran civil society's long tradition of fighting for human rights. Uh, so a fear that threatens the very tradition of struggle for social and environmental justice to which these five water defenders have dedicated their lives. So the underlying message that we received was that for Salvadorans to stop living in fear, it is imperative that this struggle to defend human rights of the Santa Marta Five, of the five water defenders, and also of all Salvadorans is absolutely vital that it continue on. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Alejandro. And before I turn to Angela Sanbrano, just a reminder that you can type questions into the Q&A box, or you will be able to simply uh, raise your hand uh, the raise hand function, and uh, we will recognize you and you can ask your question. Uh, finally, Angela. Yes, um, thank you, John and Alejandro, and thank you for joining this press conference. The um, delegation was extremely alarmed at the, uh, amidst the human rights violations, the movement towards authoritarian government, the corruption and lack of transparency of the Bukele government that neither the US or the Canadian government or European Union governments are currently speaking up publicly for shift towards democracy. Members of the US Congress and the Canadian parliament have been critical, but the executive branches of both governments are now quiet. Inexplicably, in the summer of 2023, the Biden administration has shifted gears from two years ago when it spoke out clearly about Bukele's moves to restrict democracy. Over the past few months, we have seen an increase in the level of public officials, including Secretary Blinken, welcoming Salvadorian Foreign Minister Alexandra Hill in DC with a press conference. What, what message does this send just a few weeks ahead of an election in which Bukele is running um, in violation of the constitution of El Salvador? Simil similarly, the Canadian government remains silent. The delegation asks why the complete shift in policy? So given this, um, our recommendations are to the government, to the Salvadorian government, based on the principles of respect for the rule of law, due process, 
democracy, and human rights, we urge you to drop the charges against the Santa Marta Five, withdraw the state of emergency, reestablish suspended rights, restore the independence of the different branches of the state, including the executive, legislative, and judiciary, and maintain the prohibition on metallic mining. To the government of the United States and Canada, we urge you to advocate now for the dropping of the charges against the Santa Marta Five based on the principles of the respect for the rule of law, due process, democracy, and human rights. And the amnesty in the 1992 peace agreements and national reconciliation law adopted one week after the historic peace agreements in which it's still in full force to this day. In, a, in addition, we urge to one, attend as international observers to all upcoming trials of the five water defenders. Two, call for return to democracy in El Salvador, the cancellation of the quote, state of exception and the restoration of the independence of the different branches of the government, as I stated earlier, executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Three, instruct the US and Canadian IMF executive directors to oppose Bukele's request for a $1.3 billion loan. And to the government of the United States, we urge you to diligently implement Assistant Secretary of State Nichols, the October 23rd comment about the US government, quote, unbreakable commitment to supporting and protecting civil society actors in El Salvador. Clearly, that's not happening. And we're demanding that they clearly defend and protect, that, that, that they demand that Bukele protects civil society of El Salvador. To the government of Mexico, Spain, Colombia, and Venezuela, we ask that, that they, that the state, that they, um, their government, uh, that they state clearly that they intend to protect the commitments made in the peace agreements signed in 1992 in Mexico City at the Castillo de Chapultepec. Some of us were witness to that peace agreement. It was negotiated under the auspices of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and it was signed by representatives of the government of El Salvador and the FMLN insurgency. So these are uh, very um, important agreements that we're, we're demanding of these governments to do. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Anjala. And now we get into questions and answers. And again, anyone who has questions, please put them in the Q&A function. We have one here. I'll start. We have a couple. Uh, first, um, can you tell us, and Alejandro, you might want to start on this. Can you tell us about what are the threats to dismantle that 2017 Mining Ban Act? And how is it linked uh, in the delegation's view to the arrest of those five activists. Yeah, thank you. This is a very important uh, finding that we found in, in our, our delegation. Uh, even before we got there, there had been evidence of um, El Salvador's um, kind of moving towards re-establishing mining, or at least preparing the ground for such moves in the future. Um, in 2021, for example, uh, there was a new uh, public agency that was created called the General Directorate of Energy, Hydrocarbons, and Mines. Um, in a country that doesn't allow mining, we, we found that to be very kind of odd that, that this, you know, exists to, to regulate mining. In that same year, um, El Salvador joined the International Pro-Mining Institution called the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, Metals, and Sustainable De Development, basically a group that um, is very adamant that mining is is good for economies and, and for, for people, even though there's a, a ton of evidence uh, showing the contrary. Um, but also just the, the the arrest of the five is alarming in, in the sense that it, it is an attack directly at the heart of a movement uh, that was so successful in El Salvador that 
that really succeeded where no other country has in being able to ban metal mining. Um, so in, in figuring out why these five, why why target these five when when justice for you know human rights abuses should always start with those who perpetrated the vast majority of those injustices, which is the Salvadoran military. Um, so it's just very odd, this choice of these five water defenders to pursue them, unless you understand the broader context of mining in El Salvador and the state's um, movement towards reestablishing mining. And just lastly, when we heard of evidence in Cabanas itself from local officials and community members of people coming in to the very territories where mining was proposed to buy land, to lease land, unknown people um, that, have, that have been uh, somehow linked to mining. So there's a, there's a great fear in El Salvador that this mining ban could be overturned for all of these reasons. Thanks so much, Alejandro. So good, thank you. Keep the questions coming. We have several here and we should be able to get to all of them. The next one, Angela, um, might ask you to think about as a lawyer, there's a question that says, considering Naib Bukele is not longer the legal president, is not any more legal president of El Salvador as a result of the violation of several articles of the constitution related to the reelection act, are you willing to take the case to the International Criminal Court? And just a quick thing, let me say before Angela responds, um, Naib Bukele, has been president in, in El Salvador, as in many Latin American countries, you can only be president for one term. He twisted this in a way um, to, he has actually stepped down as president for six months. He stepped down on December 1st. If he wins on February 4th, he starts again on June 1st. So this is a, a, a total twisting of the, of the constitution. And part of the question is what, what can be done uh, in the face of that, other than denouncing it. As Angela said in our recommendations, we are calling on the US and Canadian governments and other governments to denounce this uh, and make it clear that he is an illegal president and therefore he should, he should be dealt with differently. But I'm curious, Angela, in terms of any international uh, steps that you think could be taken, uh, do you think this could be a case for the International Criminal Court? Sure. Uh, definitely. Um, I think that we have we must consider, regardless of whether Bukele uh, is um, again and actually an illegal president or not, um, we we will consider all legal uh, remedies that we have. We we I think that we have the responsibility to the five uh, water defenders, but the society in El Salvador. Uh, to make sure that um, that their rights, their human rights are not violated. And we should and must take it to the highest uh, courts, uh, in, not only in El Salvador, but also in, in internationally. And uh, we, we will use all the legal remedies, both nationally and internationally. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and by the way, if others of you have ideas on this, please share them with us. Obviously, this um, the report, by the way, uh, was the delegation was co-sponsored by the Share Foundation and the Institute for Policy Studies. But there are seven other groups that have co-endorsed it. If others of you have ideas, please do get back to um, Viviana at Mining Watch, uh, Val at Mining Watch, the folks who contacted you about the press event. We are open to any and all. A group of us meet once a week to consider new new steps that could be taken. Um, next question um, from a journalist. Can you tell us more about Canada's financial aid and support to the Salvadoran government? Do you have information that some Canadian mining companies intend to go back to El Salvador? Um, I don't, so uh, aid to El Salvador comes in many forms. Um, the biggest aid givers are the United States, the European Union, Germany, Spain. Canada does give some uh, support and Canada, a key thing for Canada and the United States right now is that the Bukele government for several years has been trying to negotiate a, a loan from the International Monetary Fund, a huge one, 1.3 billion US dollars. And Canada as an executive director at the IMF, so does the United States. 
we are urging them to vote no, given the evidence that previous loans that have come through uh, from, from international banks and lending facilities have been used for corruption. And if any of you, there's some evidence of that in the report. So um, that we're definitely urging that in terms of mining companies, simply to say the big mining company that was trying to uh, mine in El Salvador at the time that the mining prohibition was put in place in 2017 was an Australian Canadian company called Oceana Gold. And uh, as you all know, many of you know, the biggest mining companies in the world are Canadian and Australian. Uh, and gold is at a record high level. No mining company has indicated any um, public interest in coming back in because there's a mining prohibition. What is going on behind the scenes, obviously, is um, it was found in 2015, 16, 17, that there's a great deal of gold in El Salvador. El Salvador is part of a, of a band of gold that starts in Mexico and goes through the mountains of, of Central America. The mining companies know this. So if Bukele were to overturn that ban, there would be a flood of interest. I don't know, Alejandro, if you have anything uh, to add to that. I'll just uh, briefly mention the economic context of El Salvador also um, lends itself to um, this, the Salvadoran state wanting to reopen mining as it finds itself in an ever more precarious economic position, whether or not mining will actually aid the Salvadoran public. Uh, we, we know that often it does not. At least the rhetoric of being able to say, look, we've attracted foreign direct investment to the country would, would greatly aid the image of, of Bukele and his, his governing of, of the economic situation in El Salvador. So that adds another uh, layer to uh, ex explaining why these five uh, water defenders have been targeted. Um, really, as, as to set an example of the willingness, the, the brazen willingness to go after um, some of El Salvador's most celebrated uh, social movement activists. Um, it, it's quite alarming. Great. And we have one more question. If any, I think we probably have time for two. If anyone else has one, please do put it in either the chat or the Q&A. Uh, but one uh, from, from Mining Journal. Um, this gets to the first question, but I'm curious if, if we have anything we want to add here. We mentioned in the report that we initially set out to investigate the circumstances around the arrest of the five, the Santa Marta five. Uh, and as we did it, we quickly realized the broader link with the government's intention to overturn the mining ban. Could you elaborate how you came to that conclusion? Now, Alejandro has given some of the evidence in the first answer, but I think, um, I mean, just one thing I would add to it is that it was very interesting as we, all of us have traveled to El Salvador, we've been to the north of the country year in and year out. And it was over a year ago that we began to get reports of people coming into the heart of mining country. It's the town of municipality of San Isidro. This is where there was a mine right after World War II, very lucrative mine, gold mine. Um, People were coming in, some from Peru, people from outside of the area, and they were, they were talking about leasing land or buying land. And this is some of the worst agricultural land in the country. It's very dry, it's very rocky. And they were offering vast sums to lease land or buy land around where the original mine that operated between 1947 and 1953 is. And so that's where it became clear that it wasn't just, the, the government was sending signals to people in the mining community that it might, it might be open to this. So we've been hearing it both on the ground there. And keep in mind, the most, the beginning of the anti-mining struggle in El Salvador, we lay this out in the report some, and it's, it's very well documented in the Water Defenders book, is that Back in the um, early 2000s, mining companies started to flood back into El Salvador and they pinpointed this area because of the very rich uh, mineral deposits. So there's a great deal of study that was done by geologists of, of how much gold is there. So everybody knows where the gold is. They have simply been 
And there are gold mines right across the Lempa River in Honduras. There are gold mines right across the border in Guatemala. Um, all of it makes El Salvador prime country for gold mining if it were to allow mining again. And just a final point for me on this is that El Salvador is the worst place in the world to do mining. It has one big uh, river system, the, liver, the Lempa River. It has earthquakes, it has typhoons, all it has biodiversity around the areas where there's, where there's minerals. All of this led experts to conclude that the whole country should be a no-go zone for mining. The public is overwhelmingly behind that. And that's why Bukele would be going against that if he decides for the very rich, I mean, gold is very precious right now, $2,000 an ounce. Um, he would be going against both scientific fact and the public will where he to decide to mine. Um, I don't know, let's see if there's any final questions uh, here before we, uh, before we close. Alejandro, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add uh, to that um, or anything else uh, just going through the messages here. We thank you all. Alejandro, any final points you wanna make on that? I think you covered it all quite, quite succinctly. Yeah. Thank you, John. And the final question, just is there any evidence that the Chinese are interested in mining too? Um, there have been discussions between China and um, El Salvador around a free trade agreement. Um, the Chinese definitely are interested in mining across Latin America. Uh, there was some, there were rumors that it was potentially Chinese who were sending the people to um, Northern El Salvador, so we wouldn't be surprised. But again, people are being very careful about it. Um, let me end just by reminding you, please do, there's a link to the report in the chat uh, that Viviana has just put up. Uh, the report is called State of Deception. Um, it is there both in English and in Spanish. Uh, and sorry, finally, one last question that has been put up. Considering Bukele is on the edge of a major economic crisis as a result of corruption, he is selling everything, including citizenship therefore recently opened doors for, for oil exploration. Um, how, are will, how are you willing, again, to take legal action to stop such uh, exploration? So any thoughts, Alejandro or Angela, again, on, on ways, legal or otherwise, that people could stop um, some of the more extreme things that the Bukele administration might be considering? Angela. Yeah. Well, I think that um, that the one of the things that we have we must do is to make sure that the um, that the law against mining is not reversed or is not or he's not allowing uh, mining uh, companies to come in and explore. That's the first thing I think that stopping that and making sure that the mining law that is in existence is not um, uh, taken away uh, by political movidas, you know, we call them. Uh, and so I think that that's the first, the first thing, because if he's able to, um, to basically um, eliminate the law that exists right now, then it's open field and open field. So that's really important that we focus on that and use all the tools, all the legal tools that we have, both nationally and internationally. I think we need to prepare for that. Uh, and uh, I, I just also wanted to note that that the arrests of the um, five water defenders uh, are also uh, in violation of the national reconciliation law that was passed in five days. We will be uh, commemorating the um, the the passing of the um, the peace agreements and the um, and the national reconciliation law. I mean that civil war would cost. P uh, the people of El Salvador. It was a twelve-year war. It seventy over seventy-five thousand people died, eight thousand people disappeared, one million people left as refugees. Uh, and so it's like it cost a lot of blood, a lot of suffering for Bukele to come back and basically do away without that, th those agreements. It's not. It's unconstitutional. And it's unfair. Thanks so much. Uh, and thanks uh, as we close up here to both Alejandro, Angela, also to the other 
uh, authors of this report, let me just mention um, Robin Broad, Pedro Cabezas, Bernie Hammond, Manuel Perez Rocha, Heather White, Ross Wells, and Scott Wright. Also, for those of you listening, um, we are urging you all, thank you for paying attention to this. This is a year, 2024, when there will be mm -hmm. the most elections in the world, in the history of the world. It's just a lot of them, from the US to India to Mexico and beyond. We thank you for paying attention to this one. The Salvadoran one is off the radar screen of many because it's just assumed that Bukele will win, but it is critically important for all of the reasons we've stated here. His, his total disregard for civil liberties as he pursues the gangs is being has attracted attention among right-wing forces across the hemisphere and even in other parts of the world. Therefore, it's critical that attention be put on this election, be put on this report, and be put on El Salvador. And I'll simply say for the groups involved and the Canadian groups that co-endorsed include Mining Watch Canada, the United Church of Canada, and also the Public Service Alliance of Canada. All of us are committed to continuing this work um, we're pushing hard for the dropping of the charges against the five. We will continue to work until that happens. And when that happens, we will also continue to work on the broader set of issues that Alejandro and Angela laid out. And we will continue to put pressure on our governments. As Angela said, we feel it is outrageous right now that the Canadian and US governments uh, are standing back and remaining silent silent in the face of the abuses that, that we've outlined in this report, and we will continue to pressure them uh, to change those policies. So thank you all for being here. Uh, continue to be involved. If as you're writing your pieces, you have further questions, just let um, Viviana and others who brought you onto this press conference know, and all of us would be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you all for the rest of you who've watched this. Um, Thanks so much and um, please continue to be involved. Thank you.